Now let me give you the open office. So thank you so much for that uh, welcome. I'm very happy to be here. I mentioned to several of you that I was actually here about 10 years ago for a conference on censorship uh, that was sponsored by the Frank Nixon Center. It was actually one of the best conferences I've ever been to. It was so great that I still have my name tag. Yes. Um, just to remind myself that I was out the, at the Outlaw Conference. Um, there were just wonderful authors there. There are very few conferences that are on censorship alone. And just to be with Matthew and Jack Woodson, all of these incredible authors was um, one of the best experiences I've had in my academic life when it was here at Western State. So I really appreciate being asked to come back here again. Um, because I've always remembered that experience. Uh, these will remind me about it. <laughs> so I've always been like, oh, that's what I'm saying. I love conference that president. So I'm here to talk about books in the culture war. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this picture. This is actually on the cover of my book, uh, Book in 21st Century America. This is actually from the Tucson Unified School District when the Mexican American Studies program was dismantled, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, what they actually did was walk into the classrooms, box up the book, label them as banned books, please remove, and put them in a warehouse. And um, I remember seeing this particular picture and just being like, this is amazing. You never really see something so stark. Um, but it really shows how determined they were to get these particular books and actually dismantle this program in Tucson. So what I'm going to talk about today is really why books, why public schools and libraries, why now, and how can we respond? So a little background on me. I have been interested in dead books since I was a kid. My mother was a high school librarian for 32 years in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, we always observed Band Books Week. So she would bring home the lists, the bookmarks, the posters, all of those things every week in September or October. It's generally when uh, Band Weeks was the list was. And I was always very upset that Judy Blue, who's one of my favorite authors, was on that list. I could not understand why people were upset about Judy Blue's books. Um, let me just say as an aside, I am now the uh, chair of the board of the National Coalition of Censorship. Um, Judy Bloom was a long time member of the board. I never got to meet her in person, but I do get emails from her. <laughs> and it's one of the greatest things that happens when I see I have an email from Judy Bloom. <laughs> um, she is still working quite hard in, uh, in Florida. Book banning and censorship has become, it's always been a major aspect of her life, but even now, today, um, she is still working for the freedom of expression. So, when I decided to do my doctoral work, I decided that I really wanted to understand why people ban books. I had previously studied um, gender religious studies and looked at uh, evangelicalism and fundamentalism in America. And I really combined these topics to study censorship, understand what people were trying to accomplish 
by banning books in their meetings. <laughs> so a little bit of an overview of terms. When I talk about intellectual freedom, I mean that it is the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. It provides for free access to all expressions of ideas through which any and all sides of question, cause, or movement may be explored. So that's from the American Library Association. It's a fairly basic definition of social freedom. Censorship is the opposite. It is the suppression of ideas and information that certain persons, individuals, groups, government officials find objectionable or dangerous. What you should also know is that people often use the government to impose their own individual ideals. So although I'm making those separate by saying individuals, government, groups, in fact, they can all be in one person at a time. What I look at is what I call censorship practices. We actually all engage in various censorship practices for ourselves. So, what I like to talk about is that I don't watch our movies. I like to sleep at night. I just <laughs> do not really watch them. They have to be classic. So, yes, I've seen The Exorcist. I've seen Silence of the Lambs, usually on a Saturday, during the day, with all the lights on, while I sleep, right? So I do take other things while watching this movie. Um, the reason I use practices is that it gets more to the activities that people are engaging in. So there are four active practices of censorship. These are what I call the four R's. This is redaction, restriction, relegation, and removal. I'll go through those one by one. So redaction is actually what you see on classified documents all the time, right? People will mark through something. The way we see it in libraries is that somebody will be upset about something in a book, and so they'll just like sometimes put a piece of tape over it, and it'll come back and you'll be like, this person put this piece of tape on this book. Um, or they'll mark through with a sharpie. And actually, if you've heard about the case um, in McMinn County, Tennessee, with the mouse um, by Art Spiegelman, what they actually wanted to do was to cover up the images that they were upset about. Um, they found that this was a copyright act violation, so they weren't able to do that. But this is a form of redaction. Restriction, on the other hand, is what I'd say, what I call putting something behind the desk. So this is when someone will say, in order to get this particular item, material, you have to ask for permission from somebody. The teacher, the librarian, anyone, this is a restriction because it reduces access to that information. You have to go through a gatekeeper in order to get access to that, which actually, as you can see, reduces privacy. You have to disclose to someone, I want to read this thing. They have to give you permission to do it, and then you can see how this actually becomes a censorship. Relocation is a little bit different. If you think about this in a public library in particular, this is where people say, this book is not actually a book for youth. It doesn't belong in the juvenile section. It actually belongs in the young adult section or mostly the adult section. And this is usually said, um, this is against the audience that the author intended. So the author intended it to be a book for Juveniles, youth, children, young adults, but someone has determined, I disagree with that particular um, way of classifying that book, and actually all these books should be in the adult section. Or they go into something called like a parenting section, that's another way that things get relocated. So this limits access because you are seeing that it becomes more difficult for the intended audience to find that particular material. Removal is what most people think of when they think of censorship. But it's important to know that what the request is can be quite different. So removing something from, say, a public library collection is different from removing something from a curriculum, which is different from removing something from the school library, which is different from removing something from a bookstore, which we have actually seen requests for this. 
So removal, it seems like it's very simple at first, it's just removal from the collection. But you have to see that there are actually different valences to that request depending on the context. So once again, those are the active practices of redaction, restriction, relocation, and removal. Passive practices are things like self-censorship. So you decide not to write about something because you are worried about what the response to that is. You are worried that, in fact, people will be upset about it. Bias is when you decide, for example, not to buy something because you are worried about the response to it. Or you disagree with something that has been written in a particular work and you decide I don't want to add that to my collection because I think it's wrong for some reason. So those are passive practices. More broadly, I study something I call the discourse of censorship. So this is the language that's used to justify those censorship practices. I look at relationships among power, identity, the nature of knowledge, also, the status of public institutions like libraries and schools and communities, how people perceive institutional practices like collection development and libraries, and most importantly for me, reading practices, which I will get into in a little bit. So, this is actually a picture that I took uh, on February 20th at the Metro Metropolis Public Library in Southern Illinois. Metropolis is home of the largest Superman. A statue in the world. Um, they're also that's how their paper is called the Metropolis Club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it's called. So um, this is pretty typical of a book hearing. There were people going out the door. Um, there was actually a protest in front of this tiny Carnegie Library when I drove up. I don't think there are a thousand people in Metropolis, Illinois, maybe on a good day. Um, but you can see that there were tons and tons of people in this. Books and libraries really get people um, involved. They are something that goes really straight to understanding who we are as people and how we understand knowledge. So what I use in my work are um, a few different theories, but the one I'll focus on now is from Stanley Fish. Um, this is from the Sarah text in this class. Uh, Fish talks about interpretive communities. These are the experiences that people give to a text structure. He argues that there's no embedded meaning in the text. Instead, it's the baggage that you bring to a text that helps you interpret it. It's the interpretation that creates meaning. Along with that, we often think of like reading as a solitary experience, but in fact, it's a social experience. You bring your baggage from all these things that have happened before. You might be part of reading communities, like on Goodreads, right? You bring all of these different parts of you to thinking about reading. So what do I mean by reading practices? What I look at are past and present reading models that have been developed by historians as a conceptual framework for understanding how we read today. So in fact, censorship can be a sort of reading practice, right? It's a way of saying, I'm not going to engage with this text. So what do I look at over time? This is mostly from the areas of book history and literature studies. So if you're interested, um, there's an entire conference dedicated to this, um, the Society for History of Publisher publishing um, that really talks about how we understand reading texts, publishing over time. So here we have reading through the ages, and I'll start up with the books. Um, we're going to talk right now. So it used to be that everybody read aloud. Silent reading was only introduced in the Middle Ages. So what the monks would do is they would sit in their rectory and someone would read from the Bible out loud. Why is reading aloud important? What it means is that someone knows what you're reading and they can intervene if something is tricky and needs 
particular interpretation. So you come up with a difficult uh, verse in the Bible, someone can say, and this is how you should think about that. I go into lots of other things about the forces of the scripture, but where this actually shows up in current reading practices is that people talk about how I saw my child reading this and I saw that they were embarrassed. Or I don't know what they might be reading on their phone. So they could be reading a book that I'm unaware of because they are reading silently. There's not as much room for intervention when you read silently. So in the early modern era, this is really the Reformation. And there are several things that evolved in the Reformation. So this saw a new relationship between the written word and the text. And a little bit of Reformation theology, what we had was the doctrine of sola scriptura. So what that is, is that you can save your soul based on a text alone. If you think about what that means, it means that by reading, you can actually change whether or not you will go to heaven. Um, there's also the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, which means that there's no one between you and the text. These are very powerful understandings of what reading is, right? It's not just something that you do on an everyday, you know, that it's just kind of come from. It can actually change who you are as a person, and what happens not only to your physical body, but your metaphysical body, right? What will happen to you after you die? As we move to the modern era, what we see is that there are descriptions about who has critical distance from the text. So who is able to reason through texts well? It will not surprise you that the people who are most able to reason through texts from it. In fact, women and children are seen as not having the capability to say, when was the last time you saw a book intended for men on any of these lists? We rarely see horror or thrillers on those lists. You sometimes see erotic romance, right? Fifty Shades of Grey was very controversial when it came out. Um, there are many libraries who will not collect what they call erotica. And then, of course, there are tons of children's books on these. There's an the idea that children cannot, children and women especially, cannot have a distance from a text. They don't have what Lyons calls the capacity for resistance and disbelief. Finally, this is combined with something we have in the U.S., which is really based on Scottish common sense philosophy, which is the idea that words mean what they say and say what they mean. So this is, of course, um, embedded in, in our foundational text of we hold these truths to be self-evident. Our founders were very much influenced by Scottish common sense philosophy. And this is actually what we see with people who are challenging to confess. They say, this is what it says. When I was testifying at the Senate, Senator Kennedy read out from, uh, it was all boys are blue for me, with the idea that of course you will be offended by what it says. This text says what it means and means what it says. That there is not any room for having other interpretations than the interpretation that Kennedy so, what else do we see in the current book challenges of today? So, almost all of the books that are challenged today are what we call diverse books. I do want you to know that diverse books actually has a very particular interpretation. So, my former advisee, Amina Lawrence, talks about how diverse books are not about like shape romances, right? Those are not considered diverse. Diverse books have a political viewpoint. So it's not just that there are certain characters who have certain traits in these books, it is actually that they have a particular ideology viewpoint attached to them that makes them a so-called diverse book. But what I found was that there are actually a couple different things that you see in the arguments that people give for challenging diverse books. 
lens. This goes more into what I'm looking at in the diverse movement discourse of censorship. So books that are about LGBTQIA people are seen as being, by definition, about sex. Even if they are about two penguins taking care of a pink. By definition, a book that is about a same-sex relationship must be about sex. Also, books that are about people who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color are seen to be radical in some way. And often the request is that we'll just read something else, as if there is one story for people who are BIPOC, and that there are not a whole bunch of stories that can be seen. So where I saw this was, um, instead of reading, um, I know why the cage bird said say, um, things, Someone suggested that um, Gifted Hands by Ben Carson, as if these are <laughs> similar books. I'm not saying whether or not one is better than the other, but in fact, um, Maya Angelou and Ben Carson have very different understandings of their world. They are quite different people. Just because they have a shared identity of being Black in America does not mean that they agree on anything else related to any related to that topic. Um, and in fact, you see this idea, and this actually comes from Jim um, that there's just one story that can be told about by how people. You can also see when you get to issues of intersectionality, so something like George M. Johnson's All the Boys Are Blue, you get a mix of these arguments because George M. Johnson, they are a, um, <coughs> a non-binary person from New Jersey. So you get a lot of different arguments about that book. One thing all these books have in common is what can be called difficult knowledge. So this is from Harriet Robinson. Um, this is adult knowledge that many adults find challenging to address in their own lives, but especially with children. So sometimes I talk about, well, how do you explain that the people who were here before are no longer here? How do you explain that to an adult? How do you explain that to someone who's four years old and asks, well, where did all those people go? That is a very difficult conversation to have. And it's not even one that we always have answers readily in our mind when we're talking to adults about it. Um, this is also true of issues of sex. Almost anything kind of has to do with identity. These are conversations that are difficult for adults to have, much less to have with children. So what Carrie Robinson argues, though, is that why we should not engage in censorship is that they deny children both agency and vocabulary to describe their own lives. So what you are saying in many ways is, I don't want you to be able to talk about who you are as a person. I'm going to deny that vocabulary to you. That is always often quite harmful for children. So I'll give a short story about this. Um, Roby Harris, who wrote It's Perfectly Normal, was on the board with me um, on NCAC. She recently died. Um, she talked about how a mother came up to her and said, thank you for writing this book. My child pointed to a page on the book, which is a book about sexuality, and said, daddy is doing this to me. It was the only way that the child was able to talk abuse that was happening in the home. Without that book, they would not have had the vocabulary to tell their mother what was happening and to be removed from that situation. This is the kind of harm that actually can happen when you deny people the ability to describe their own lives. So this is how I do my work. I basically look for arguments that people make against books, and then I code it. 
Um, so this is actually from the Patmos Library in uh, Michigan, which is under threat of closing. Um, you can see here that somebody talks about how participation in sexual dialogue with a minor is illegal, it's called grooming. Also, you can see this read aloud argument. If an adult were charged, were to read some of the books in the library to a minor, they would be legally charged. I told you that reading aloud comes up quite a bit. <clears throat> this, on the other hand, is this next one. It's from Metropolis again. And it really shows how um, difficult it can be, be to talk about things that have involved difficult knowledge. So this person said, you don't know what's in these books, or even if I read you the thing on the back, it will tell you. This has a sex scene in it, describes an intimate detail, but sex is in a very graphic way. So when my kid, when they grow up, they go to the library, say, Mom, I want you to read this book. And some parents would say it's okay. There's always an argument about other parents. Other parents are falling down on the job. I am a good parent, but those other people are not good parents. Um, so they would say it's okay to check it out, and I would have no idea what was in it. Um, I wouldn't let that happen, because I would monitor very closely with reading. But I just don't think that sexualized content of any kind should be put in front of my children. I don't think it should be advertised just the same way that we don't have a big Christian solution that says, hey, everybody come over there, over here. You see, there's not really a definition of what sexualized content is. Recall that I said that any book about LGBTQIA is always labeled as being about sex, whether it contains sex or not. So this is really getting to what people are talking about. I have stumbling here also because often people talk about stumbling on, right? I didn't know my kid would stumble on this particular topic, and I didn't know how to respond when they did. Um, so the idea that the library is kind of a loosey-goosey place where anything goes and you'll just run into information um, as if it's the collections are not carefully curated by people who are experts. So uh, this is kind of how people think about books. I love these altered books. Um, it's as if the text jumps out at you. Um, so what I talk about in my research um, is reading practices, as I mentioned, um, that there are common sense interpretations, um, that text can only be interpreted in a certain way. I call this a monosemic uh, interpretation as, a poly as opposed to a polysemic interpretation of texts. Um, that words say what they mean and mean what they say. As to talk about the fear of a disciplined imagination, this is especially true of women and children, as I mentioned. Um, that people that, because of this undisciplined imagination, uh, you will do what you read about. So it's often seen as if a book is a permission structure, that if you read about something, you will do it. So this sometimes comes up with drugs or sex or something like that. Um, also, there's a lot of argument about short and long-term effects of reading. So <clears throat> books can lead to a short-term effect, like social arousal, or they can lead to a long-term effect, like having bad moral character. Remember, I said that books can change your soul. They can change who you are as a person. That is really the arguments that we see people make when they challenge books. So last week, the American Library Association put out the number of challenge titles challenge. You'll see that it has gone up um, precipitously over the past three years. I should actually say like the year before in 2020, I think it was under 500. So this has been going up quite a bit. <coughs> So why does this happen? And this is my absolute favorite Haley poster, um, the idea that words have power. Um, it really summarizes my research. Uh, we all believe that reading is fundamental and that words have power because they can change you as a person. <laughs> so why public schools 
and migrants. So this really goes to the issue of public goods. So I have the White House here, and this is a famous example of um, public goods. It's available to all, and everyone can benefit. Um, this is a core value of librarianship, um, that the library itself is a public good. It supports information access and the principle of intellectual freedom for all. This is actually very contested in our country. We are not so sure about public goods in general. Um, the library is a place where we actually involve ourselves in collective action to, and I'm talking specifically about public libraries and public schools here, where we involve ourselves in collective action for the good of the community as a whole. Our society is highly individualistic. We are not so sure about um, when the public school movement and the public library movement began in the late 19th century, this was started by the robber barons. They wanted a more educated workforce. People were very suspicious that you would take education out of the home. We are one of the only countries in the world that allows homeschooling. That is just unheard of in places like France. Everybody goes to the same school. Actually, in the Netherlands, everybody goes to the same school, goes to school on the same day, right? There's one day where all the kids just go off to school and then they come back. Um, this is not true across the world that you can take your children out of school and have them educated at home. Um, these are things that we hold quite dear in this country, and we often hold public goods and things like public education and libraries with a bit of suspicion. And this is just something that's been true since the late uh, 19th century. I also talk about this wonderful book by Heather McGee. I cannot uh, recommend this book enough. So this is The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Um, Heather McGee talks about a pool, you might have heard about this, in Montgomery, Alabama. Rather than integrate the pool, which is apparently a jewel of a pool, um, people would go there and apparently had slides and all sorts of things. Rather than integrate the pool, it was cemented up and covered with grass. There's still no pool like it. What I see today is that people are saying, I would rather not have the library than have these 10 books on the shelf. You can see that there are some similarities here. I would rather not have the pool than have it integrated. What Heather McGee says is that public goods are seen as a worthy investment only so long as the public is seen as good. So who is considered good enough to have these investments There's often a fear of indoctrination. So this is actually from Bill F. Turn. Um, I do some work on indoctrination. Uh, I.A. Snook in 1970 talks about four main components of indoctrination, intent, content, method, and outcome. So this is really talking about, a lot of times people talk about intent, right? There's an intention when you collect a certain book or you put a book in the book curriculum or to have an outcome that is known by all. Um, this is, of course, not what educators do. Educators are trying to open up the world of possibilities to their students. Um, but I think it is important to see where these arguments come from. <clears throat> There's also issues of accountability and control. So this is for Ahmed Khalid and Jeffrey Aaron Snyder. They talk about um, how often with when it comes to taxpayers is a confusion over accountability versus control. As taxpayers, we will hold our city accountable for maintaining the work rules, but we won't tell the construction crews what kind of asphalt to use when the So this is something that we see a lot is that people really want to have control over public institutions as opposed to making institutions accountable. 
to the community as a whole, not necessarily to the loudest person. So what is this happening now? Um, a lot of this has to do with the demographic shifts. So um, as many of you know, by 2040, we will be a majority minority country. Um, you can see on this map that this has already happened in many places across the country. Um, these shifts are visible in communities. Communities that were once all white are now 90%. 80%. This changes what the community looks like. And often this can be very uncomfortable for people. What they knew before this community looked like a certain way, it doesn't look like that anymore. Um, how people respond to that, the thing about the public library and the public school is that they are local. They are local in the community. It is something that anybody can go to the board meeting, as opposed to whatever might be happening in Washington, where everybody can <clears throat> and you know, say what they're upset about. So these demographic shifts are very important for understanding what is going on in our country. <clears throat> I also talked about the pandemic. I just updated these numbers. We actually don't know what the outcome of the pandemic will be. Remember that the end of Black Death led, led to the end of feudalism, an entire way of life. Um, we probably won't see what the outcome of this pandemic will be. Uh, we already know there are things about working. I'm also noticing that there's a relaxation of child labor laws. I think that has to do with some of the things that are going on with the pandemic. This is just an unknown uh, of what we will see in the outcome of the pandemic. But one of the main things that happened during the pandemic was that school came home. So I have stepkids, they go to school, they come back. I ask them what happened, how was school? It's fine. I have no idea what happened at school, right? Um, I'm sure it was great. I'm sure they learned things. But I don't really know. It's just a black box. That was not true during the School was at the dining room table. And in fact, pedagogy has changed a lot over the past 20, 30 years. How teachers talk about different topics has changed radically from when I was in school. And I think there were people who were quite alarmed by this. I actually got an email from a person who was like, absolutely right, it's all bad. And so I was like, well, thank you for this data. I really appreciate that you you know, short up my theory on this. <laughs> you also can't discount George Floyd's murder and protest. So um, I live in soybeans and cornfield, Illinois. I am not near Chicago. Um, our tiny, tiny towns um, that are 99% white had Protests, often led by young people after George Floyd's murder. I think a lot of parents were unsure of where their children got the idea that they could protest <laughs> in their tiny town. Um, what we see with these books is a reaction to some of those protests. They really did have across the country in places that were quite unexpected. Um, we heard about the ones in the larger cities, of course in Minneapolis, but in fact, there was one in all of the small towns surrounding Champaign, Indiana, in um, Illinois. And we are simply in a time of reactionary politics. Um, we are a generation after the civil rights movement. We are seeing how that will shape our world. We have, um, we had elected our first black president, and then we elected Trump, who was a reaction to that first black president. These things are still shaking out. Um, once again, you can have control over your local institutions, even if you don't have control over what happens in the election. 
So people ask me a lot about what can you do. So one of the best things you can do is read these bands. Um, there is a list of 850 band books from representative crowns in Texas. Um, I'm not so worried about the ones that are at the top of the censorship list. It's really the mid-list books. These are the authors who are most affected by these challenges to their books, the ones that you don't hear about as much. I really encourage you to find that list. It's available. I'm sure out of those 850, you will find something that interests you. It's very <laughs> likely that you will not. So please support these authors. Um, when you hear them, they talk about how their lives have been upended by these challenges. Um, they get doxxed, they get swatted, that's what the SWAT team is called out to your house. Um, you start to doubt yourself as a creative person. So Jerry Kraft, who wrote New Kid, talks about who's most in tears talking about, I cannot believe someone thought I wrote this book to hurt children. I wrote this book because I wanted children to be hurt, to understand that they're not alone. Um, so this kind of reversal, this idea that you have purposely written something so that people will be harmed, which is the farthest from people's minds when they are creating these works, I think is just something you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about these books. Also, you can be prepared and be organized. <clears throat> what I often find is that youth voices are missing a lot of times. So you might have noticed in those pictures that I saw, there were no kids at those art workings. Um, these two pictures show kids. I especially want to talk about the kids on the right. Um, they are from York, Pennsylvania, and they organized themselves. If you've ever been to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, you realize after going there how young the Civil Rights Movement was. We are talking about college students. Um, you also see how they organized. Um, they would meet at people's houses. They would practice being screamed at. Um, what these kids did in New York was actually similar. They would meet at people's houses. You see that they all have, these are all vetted signs. Um, they also had one spokesperson. So sometimes the journals would be upset because they'd be like, I want to talk to more kids. And the kids would say, no, we have a spokesperson who's the best person to speak for all of us. Um, they were successful in returning the books to their school. Um, the kids here in Florida were not. Florida has its own issues. But it is still so important that they were out. So it's not just adult voices. You actually hear from the kids themselves. Um, there's nothing, you can always tell when a kid has been show coached by their parents. That's one thing. Um, but when they are reading from something they have written themselves at the public comment, it has so much more weight than yet another adult standing up to talk about the book. Um, so the organization I'm trying to work for, we actually uh, <coughs> recruit and mobilize students to be able to talk about their full freedom of expression rights. Um, it's just a way of making sure people are trained. You actually have to be trained to be able to do, to respond in any ways to what happens at these meetings. Um, I encourage you to get involved in your national community. So there's Unite Against Book Bans, um, which is run by the American Library Association. That should, should disclose I'm a former president of the Freedom to Read Foundation, um, which is the legal arm of the American Library Association. Um, also, the National Coalition on Censorship, as I mentioned, that I'm chair of the board. Um, and Pen America is for writers. I know that they are going through some things right now. That's just kind of how it is in the creative expression community. People do not always agree on things. And you just try to do your best, try to work for all people's rights to freedom of expression. So I'll leave you with this. 
This is actually the motto for the Free and Trade Foundation. Free people, free and free. Roger Douglas said, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. This is actually why people try to keep you from reading certain books. It is to make sure that you are not introduced to ideas with which they disagree. Because being able to read means that you can take those ideas in and decide what you want to do with them. You may agree with them, you may not, but that is out of that person's control once you are able to read that book. So the charge is to get involved in your book reading politics because it's up to you to make sure that everybody can maintain their rights to freedom of expression. Thank you. Thank you. Your talk was wonderful. Oh, thank um, you. One of the questions I had is, how do you feel social media influences the banned books so or it removes the stigma from banned books? Uh, so it is a huge, um, it's a huge tool for organization on both sides, actually. So it used to be that the people who were challenging books actually had phone tests phone trees to be able to talk to various people. Um, so they often knew each other. Um, if you look at parents against bad, against bad books in schools, they've been around since the, the 90s or something like that. Um, so what social media does is that it enables people to find other people who agree with them. But what I try to say is like this is true on any side. Um, you can also use social media to organize. Um, I sometimes get into arguments with people about authenticity and all sorts of things like that. I'm like, that's not really, you can't really worry about that. You have to use the tools that are available to make sure that everybody has their rights. Um, and social media has changed almost everything that has to do with it. It also leads to additional especially of authors or people who are working in libraries and schools. Um, we don't always have answers to that, but it's just important to know that it's a tool for use on all sides of the thing. Uh, Oh, well, thank you. Um, I actually give quite a few talks, um, and uh, if you're interested in my Senate testimony, that is available on my website, which is um, I uh, also have YouTube there, so uh, yeah. but I, I, uh, I probably go for 
it since I don't hear. The Supreme Court was here today uh, whether having this information, recommending this information, that would allow a social media app. has to be sensitive. And I am not really, I think, every argument about this is a dangerous question. So, misinformation is based on people's interpretation. It is extremely hard to combat misinformation because it really has to do with what you were bringing to that test. Um, people like to say that it's going to be easy. It is not easy. Quite frankly, the only way you can combat misinformation is through education. That is all. You have to be, um, you have to have your media literacy classes. You have to think about, am I reacting to this because I simply agree with it? Um, there is no easy fix for misinformation because it is all based on your priors. I actually have a talk about this and disinformation. Um, I show this picture of these women who were um, anti-vaxxers during the COVID, um, during the pandemic. Everything they have on their signs is true. Um, it's just how do you interpret what they have on their signs? Um, you can see that they are actually coming from a place of fear about this unknown. I've talked to people about the idea that the vaccines were introduced as mRNA, right? Um, when was the last time you talked, you heard about mRNA? It's probably in your like, grade biology class, maybe in college, something to do with viruses and DNA sequencing and something like that. It sounds insidious, right? Um, I really wish the scientific community had thought about how they talked about those vaccines. Because they do sound like they're missing energy because they're called, they, they are based on mRNA, but that sounds like DNA. Are they messing with my genes if I take that vaccine? I, I will just go, I am not in fact to take the vaccine. I have been taking vaccination four times, right? But that is because I come from a place of trust in these large, powerful organizations, and I am trusting them to not do something. Right? But you can understand why someone might not feel that way. A lot of this has to do with where people are coming from. You cannot legislate out this information. That's just not a thing that can be done. Thank you, Professor Knox, so much for coming in front of the state, speaking on this. It is a such an important topic, especially considering, considering what's happening here in Fresno mm -hmm. County. Uh, I'm sure folks are aware, Steve Brandau has proposed a Fresno book suspension slash establishing parents committee. Um, actually, tomorrow morning at the Fresno County Board of Supervisors Supervisors meeting, uh, the parents committee establishment, it, or the discussions in the only consent agenda tomorrow morning and I'm curious if you would be willing to give public comment against it. I know I'm putting it on the spot a little bit, um, but I hear you about the importance of organizing. I really hope folks in this room maybe would be willing to show up tomorrow morning. Um, but yeah, it's just very concerning considering uh, the very uh, dangerous rhetoric that I know is using uh, against like, our LGBTQ plus community. Um, so I was just curious if you heard about it. Perhaps maybe that's the reason why you came to the I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. So I have heard about it. I, I, I would not be able to give um, testimony. And actually, I would not give testimony because not, I'm not a member of the community. Um, so people often wonder, what is ALA doing? Why are they not around? But it often is not helpful to helicopter in um, someone to talk about this. Let me say that the implication is that none of the librarians are parents. I highly doubt that. Also, that parents somehow know more than other people. Um, the way we are talking about parenting now is very concerning to me. Uh, 
was just talking to some attorneys about this, the idea that children are owned by their parents is really starting to be this odd discourse that is happening. That you, um, that if, because you were born to particular people, they have these rights over you that are just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, except it's like that they are old, that you belong to them in some way. Um, I find this very concerning. Children have rights. Um, minors have their own intellectual freedom rights. They have their rights to autonomy and dignity. Um, this sort of discourse uh, does not lead to good places. Um, because you inevitably, and this is very upsetting, I'm sorry to bring it up, it inevitably leads to abuse. When you think about your children as being owned by you, that they are your property. Um, I know I'm getting a little like, like worked up here, but this is, I can't see any other outcome. Um, when you say that children have no rights, so, um, I don't know what the outcome will be. Um, I, I would say that, <clears throat> you know, no matter what the outcome is, to keep fighting for people's intellectual freedom rights, keep fighting for the parents' rights. Yes? Speaking as a parent, I'd say there's a responsibility associated with that. With what? Reason to Absolutely. I did not say anything about responsibility. <laughs> I am saying that what this really gets to is that children are their own people. They may or may not agree with you and your own ideology. So I did not understand Family Ties when I was little. I did not understand that Alex P. Keaton was a Republican and his parents were hippies. I did not get that. <laughs> I'm sure they're like, where did this child come from? <laughs> that entire sitcom is about that. that you cannot determine the outcome of your child. They are the own people. You do have responsibilities. You can do your best to inculcate your values into your children. They still may not agree with you at all. They may, you are a hippie, he votes for it, right? I mean, that is really something that I think we have lost, that children are their own people. Um, and I just don't agree with where some of this rhetoric will take us, because what happens is children disappear. We have children who have disappeared since the pandemic. We do not know where they are. Um, are they with their parents? Are they being educated? We don't know. The laws in this country are so that parents have so much control over their children. And what a lot of these, these laws that we see that create up is that there is no outside adult for a child to talk to about what might be happening in their home. Um, we are all, I'm sure you all work here, are mandated reporters, right? I'm a mandated reporter. Um, that is actually a very important intervention in the life of a child. Um, and we cut off all of these avenues by saying a, child, a parent can basically just remove their child from society. And what is the, out, what is the outcome? I'm sure that doesn't happen with most parents, but there's no way that all of the people who have done that are treating their children with respect and dignity that they deserve. Yes? So I, I really appreciate the things that you said about the background of COVID and all those kinds of things. That, but what about political opportunism? I'm thinking about this, what's happening in Berkeley County. You know, the Mary comes up with the first primary election. Um, it's known that more Republicans turn out for primary elections, but the uh, Cast and the number of people who vote. You know, so I, I think that politicians, you know, Brando, for example, he's in this case, but he's, he's got stiff competition. How much of it is driven by that? A lot of it is driven.
happened by that, but we can only, we are the only people who can answer that, which is that you have to go out and vote. There is no other answer. Um, that is a right that has been taken away slowly with the decimation of the Voting Rights Act. But um, there's no reason for people who oppose this measure not to come out and vote. It's part of our civic duty to vote. And so um, I, I guess like there's really, you can't really think about opportunism as something that's always bad because it can actually be used for either side. It's really a tool. And so you also have to use those tools also. So if you want to protect the books, turn the library, what political opportunities are out there? Are you driving people to the books? I don't know. I don't have all the answers to this. But to me, <clears throat> We are the only people who can make a difference. And there's no one coming. Um, it's just, it's just the community that can make the difference. I, I, I actually think about this with all the lawsuits against um, Trump that are right now, and the constant wanting for the judiciary to save us. The judiciary is its own power embedded with systemic racism, you know, injustice, all sorts of issues, right? Um, we are the only, it's, it's only people power that can need to change. Um, that to me, that's, that was actually the most important thing I realized by visiting the civil rights museum, was that it was actually just everyday people deciding, I'm going to do this, I am going to, walk instead of getting on the bus. I'm going to protest instead of doing this other thing. I'm going to meet at this person's house instead of doing this other thing. Um, just every day making a choice, and it's just like everybody here. It's There's not more out there. Um, I, I wish I had better answers, but I don't. That's, that's all I have. Well, with that, um, it's just going to be around for a few more minutes, but um, we are beyond time. So I would like to thank you all for making the choice to be here instead of doing something else. And uh, continue to do that. So thank you all so much, and thank you, Dr. Knox.